Okay. Good evening. Good evening. How's everybody doing? Good. How are you all doing out there? Good? Good. I saw a thumbs up right through the camera. Well, what a wonderful day today, huh? Nice and warm. Was it warm today? Muggy? Yeah. Gosh. Better enjoy it while we can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to give you thanks for this beautiful day today. We give you thanks, Lord, for all the great things you've done for us. We thank you, Father, that you are our Father in heaven and that you've forgiven us and that we are your children, never to be separated from you again. And, Lord, as we gather tonight, we just want to ask you, Lord, to speak to us, encourage us, strengthen us, stir us up. Father, help us to trust you this evening. Lord, we, we want to pray concerning these elections that are going on and, and all of the stuff that's happening, Lord, and we know that you are in complete, total control. Father, we just pray that the truth would prevail. Lord, we pray that the man, a person of your choice, would sit in that seat, and we know that that is going to happen. So we thank you in advance that you are in complete, total control of all of our affairs, that you know exactly what's going on. And so, Father, we put all of our trust in you, Lord. We don't want to fret, worry, be stressed, or depressed. But, Lord, we want to be filled with joy and love, knowing that we are yours and that you have everything well in hand. So as we open your word, Lord, speak to us tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So tonight what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the very, very first psalm. Psalm 1, if you'd like to turn there. The very, very first one. Every week people say, so what are you going to be teaching on Wednesday? I don't know yet. (laughs) Tonight we're going to be teaching on Psalm 1. I know that much. All right. How many know this by heart? Psalm 1. We have one person out of 10,000 out there. (laughs) That's good, though, because if we don't know it by heart, we're going to by the time we get done tonight, right? So this is a, uh, well, this is kind of like the story of two people, if you will, two lives, two men. Could be two women, I suppose, but... Our psalm has the word man in it, so we'll use that. And you know, last week when we looked at the Beatitudes, one of the premier words in those Beatitudes was the word blessed. And I think that's one of the things that brought me to this psalm when I was pondering what to to teach on tonight, is Psalm 1 starts out the very same way as the Beatitudes. Blessed. Blessed is the man. And again, we don't have to take the time, really, I don't think, to uh, discuss what that means to be blessed. We did that last week. But it has a lot to do with happiness, doesn't it? It has a lot to do with being content. It has a lot to do with feeling um, secure in our lives. And so I'm going to go ahead and read down through this psalm. It's very short, six verses. And then we're going to go back and spend some time looking at it tonight. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in its season whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. But the ungodly are not so. They are like the chaff 
which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly will perish. So, this is a very, very basic, basic teaching that we have here, except it's broken down a little bit for us to kind of help us. A lot of times, I think, in the Bible, when we read Scripture and things, we're looking for the Scripture to tell us what to do, what we should be doing. And that's what it does, and that's a good thing about the Scripture. But this psalm is a little bit different. This psalm starts off by telling us some of the things we shouldn't do, right? And so he's telling us at the beginning, blessed is the person. Well, how is that person going to be blessed? If they take heed to the counsel that the Holy Spirit's given them in this psalm right here, that man will be blessed. But if that man chooses to do these three things, which we'll find are very progressive in nature, then he will wind up like the beginning of verse 4. They will be like chaff. So blessed is the man. Fortunate is the man. A man that knows what not to do is wise. So first of all, this man does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. When we think about that, advice, ideas, theories, Schools of thought, uh, secular thinking, if you will, um, thinking in terms of uh, the flesh, thinking in terms of getting uh, advice from people who don't know God. That's really dangerous. And I hear a lot of people talk about going to different counselors. And, and going and joining up in different programs where Jesus doesn't have anything to do with the program whatsoever, nor does the Bible. It's very secular in nature, very new agey in nature. But, but uh, David's telling us here that we shouldn't take that counsel. What counsel should I be receiving when it comes to how I'm going to live my life and the decisions that I'm going to make? Well, the Bible is my counsel. Right? The Bible gives me the information that I need to have to show me how to live my life in a godly way without having to go to the wicked for counsel or advice. Because almost every single time we do that, we get unbiblical counsel. It just, it's a pattern. It's just a natural pattern of things. So blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of of the ungodly. Now, when I'm reading this psalm, I have the picture of this guy walking. I have a picture of him walking down a sidewalk, and maybe he's window shopping for advice or help. Maybe he's just being a looky-loo, trying to get answers to life, whatever it might be. But he's not, uh, he's on the move. He's walking. And now he's beginning to receive some counsel from the ungodly and from the wicked. And what happens is he does that? Well, his walk stops. He stops walking. Now he's standing still. Now he's listening to the counsel of the ungodly. He's standing in the path of sinners. He's standing out there letting the world walk by him and, and speak to him about how he should live his life or what the answers to his questions of life will be. First, he's walking and he's getting bad counsel. Now, he's standing in the path of sinners. The next thing we see here is that he is now sitting in the seat of the scornful. And this is exactly what the counsel of the ungodly brings to us. It causes us to stop on our path, on our journey to find truth. It causes us to stand in the path of sinners, and then eventually we, we make ourselves right at home. You know, much uh, the way I perhaps would think that maybe Lot did when Abraham gave him the opportunity of 
live anywhere you want to live. And he chose to live just outside of Sodom. But the sad part about it was he was walking in the counsel of the ungodly. And, and when, before Sodom was destroyed, where do we find him? We find him actually living in Sodom. We find him actually becoming part of the scornful, sitting in that seat of the scornful, and it created a lot of problems for Lot, as we know from the Scripture. So this pr- process that we're seeing of walking, standing, and sitting, we're all going to do it. We're all going to do it. We either are going to do it with the world, or we're going to do it with God, one or the other. We're going to walk with God. That's what he wants us to do, right? He wants us to stand firm with him in our righteousness that we receive from him. And he wants us to be at home with him. But he surely doesn't want me to be at home with the world or with the counsel of the world. Or the path of sinners might be speaking of what's the latest thing that people are doing? Where's the latest parties at? Or what's the latest uh, new style that I have to follow after or whatever to go down this path of the world to find what? To find favor with the things of the world, to find favor with the ways of the world, perhaps. But it's a warning right from the very beginning that you and I have no business walking in the counsel of the ungodly, standing in the path of the sinner, or sitting in the seat of the scornful, because that's ultimately what winds up happening. It's a progressive thing. Rather, in verse 2, his delight, my delight, your delight, is in the law of the Lord. Now, I know that when, when the New Testament came into being, um, that as Christians, we're no longer under the law. We're no longer under the penalty of violating a law and being condemned to hell for it. We've all violated the law, but we know that the condemnation was put on Christ in our place. So when I look at the word law, being a rebel as I am, always in my whole life, I've been rebellious against authority and law. And I think maybe that's why I had such a hard time finding my way to Jesus, because of uh, a lack of respect for authority. But once I actually learned how much authority God has, that kind of changed my whole perception of that idea. And the law of God is good. It's good. There is nothing bad about the law of God. All it does is give us good advice, good counsel on how we should live our lives while we're here on the earth. Another psalm says that the law of the Lord is perfect, and it is perfect. It's complete, but I'm not. And so I've always found myself coming into conflict with this law of God and being afraid that if I violate it, I'm going to face these horrible consequences. Well, that's kind of the way life is, isn't it? We make choices. We deal with the consequences of our choices. But when it comes to my relationship and your relationship with God and our relationship to the law, we look at the law as a, like a schoolmaster like someone who gives us good counsel. And so it tells us that my delight is in the law of the Lord because I know that the law is good. And then he says something here that's really, really interesting. In his law, he meditates day and night. Now, I know that probably if I were to ask, nobody would raise their hand if they had been meditating on the law of God today or last night. Seems kind of be an odd statement. He meditates in his law day and night. Well, here's the difference that you and I have today from what David had in his day. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We have the Holy Spirit guiding us and directing us, empowering us to live a life that's pleasing to God. And so when we look at this and it says in his law, in the things of God, 
we should be meditating day and night. They should always be foremost on our minds because that's what drives every decision that we make, isn't it? If you make a decision that is not based on godly principles, it's going to be based on your principles or the principles of the world, but it's not God's principles. It's not God's counsel. To be able to delight in the law is a very, very awesome thing because we are now found to have no condemnation in Christ. And if we were condemned, there would be no way you would be able to delight in the law of the Lord. You'd be scared to death of it. We'd be terrified of the law of the Lord. But because of what Jesus did on our behalf, you and I can delight in the law. We can respect it. We can look upon it as something that is very, very beneficial for how I choose to live my life. There's lots of words that we have in the Bible for things like law. We have law, statutes, principles, uh, several different words such as those that pretty much describe the same thing, the principles of God, the ideas that God has laid out on our behalf to make our life fuller, to make our life better. And because we hear so many voices from the outside, because there's so much clamoring going on, there's so much effort being put forth to draw us astray or to discourage us, depress us, to bring us down, to cause us to lose hope. There's a lot of that going on around us right now. We look around the world, we look at the news, we look at all these different things, and it's like, what in the heck is there to be hopeful about? Well, our hope is not in the things of the world. Our hope is in Christ. And that's what sets us apart from the rest of the world. We do have a hope, and we know that as we meditate in the things of God, that it actually, the more we do that, the more it becomes a part of us, the more it's integrated into our very, very inner being of who we are. So who meditates, and what does that mean? I have a person that lives next door to me, and I drove by there the other day, and she was sitting out in the front yard with her legs crossed and she had her fingers touching and she was, oh, as I drove by and I was like, wow, she's meditating. So what does it mean to meditate? That's a good question, isn't it? I think, anyway. Does it mean to completely empty your mind of all thought? Does it mean to just open up to whatever voices may want to enter into my mind? What is meditating? Well, it doesn't say to meditate on nothing. It says to meditate on the law of God. So that one of the differences between the world's view of meditating and our view of meditating is it's not about emptying my mind. It's about filling my mind with the things of God. It's about rehearsing that over and over again and chewing on it over and over again until I'm able to receive all of the information, the nourishment, the knowledge, the wisdom, whatever it might be that I need by meditating upon the things of God and how good God is. So, you know, sometimes when we're thinking about how good God is, we think about, you know, well, we have a job, and we have food, and we have clothes, and we have heat in our homes, and, you know, God's really good to us. And, but, you know, there's so much more out there that makes God so good, like keeping our planet in a perfect orbit. That's pretty important, don't you think? We don't think about that very much, though, right? Or, or like, uh, like the Bible says, he tells the sea how far it can go. Right? Could you imagine if he didn't have any control over that? We'd all be fish, right? Or we'd all be jammed on some little island somewhere. Or who knows what, right? But there are so many things that we can meditate upon the greatness of God that he's in control, not just of my life, not just of my family. He's in control of the whole universe, everything that's working perfectly like a perfectly made 
clock. It's, it's moving perfectly. And when I meditate on those things, that is substance. When I can meditate on the faithfulness of God, sit back and think about how many times we have found ourselves maybe in a situation where we were worried or we were scared, fearful, and the Holy Spirit reminds us to meditate upon the things of God. Think about the things of God and you'll find comfort in those things. I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Wow, I need to meditate on that, right? That's what I need to remember all the time. So we talked about meditating before. We talked about how what it means is to chew it again. You might remember that, right? Chew it again and again and again. I always ask the question, how many stomachs does a cow have? Three, four, five, four, seven? Wow, we got a lot of different kind of cattle around here. What country is your cow from? I think they have four. Buffalo has five, maybe. I don't know. An elephant has six. I don't know. So the idea behind what I'm asking them with the stomach thing is that when a cow eats, you know, he goes and he eats in the morning, and when that tummy is nice and full, he goes and finds a nice shady spot under a tree. And he sits there and he chews his cud. So what in the heck is going on with that? Chewing his cud. Well, when it gets down into the first stomach, it processes that food. And then he regurgitates that food back up again. And he chews it again. And then it gets sent to the second stomach. And then it comes up again, and he chews it again, and it goes to the third, and then to the fourth stomach. And by the time it finds its way out the exit, that cow has pretty much taken every little bit of nourishment out of that piece of grass that he could possibly get. Chew it again. That's what he does. He chews his cud. He eats it in the morning, and then he chews on it all day long as it's being processed. Same thing with us as Christians. We eat it in the morning. We get up and we read the word. We pray. We spend time with the Lord. We do our devotionals. And we go out and we chew on that all day long until we can get every little bit of spiritual nourishment from it that we can. And that's what he's talking about here. He meditates on the things of God. It's okay to be a thinker. It's okay to process things in our minds. It's okay to ask questions. And I think it's interesting that sometimes we feel like, well, I don't know, I don't want to ask that question because maybe God will get mad at me. No, I don't think he will get mad. But I think that as we meditate on him and we meditate on his word, one thing that happens is we get to have a better personal relationship with him. It's like some people in our church I'm close to. I have a good relationship with them. Other people in the church, it's, hi, how you doing? Once a week, that's about the whole relationship we have. Hey, how's it going? Oh, pretty good. All right, see you later. Okay, that's our whole relationship. Other people I have a close relationship with. But you know what it's all about? It's all about who I'm spending time with, isn't it? It's all about who is in my life mostly throughout the week. And some of those folks aren't, and so it's hard to build a relationship with people when you're not near them or around them very often. Oh, I have a relationship, but it's kind of surfacy. It's kind of shallow, I guess. And I think it's the same way with our relationship with God, too. Some of us, our relationship with God is kind of like that folk that we see once every Sunday, and we say hi to them, and that's about it. Hey, hey, Lord, how's it going today? Pretty good, son. How you doing? Oh, great. I'll give you a call if I need you, right? If not, I'll see you in church on Sunday. Some of us wake up in the morning and we say, hey, you know what? I, I need to draw close to God before I do anything. I need to meditate on the goodness of God. I'm going to meditate day and night. That doesn't mean, you know, Paul says, pray without ceasing. So when you pray, what do you do? Close your eyes. 
Bow your head. You do that while you're driving down the road. Lord, just bless these cars around me that I don't run into anybody while I'm praying because you said pray always. I'm praying. Can I be in a conscious state of prayer even if I'm driving a car with my eyes open? Yeah, of course. Can I be listening to music or worship music on my radio and be worshiping the Lord and praying while I'm driving? Yes. Can I be mowing the lawn and thinking about the things of God? Yeah. See, here's the thing. Everything that we do, we can have the Lord at the forefront of our minds as we're doing it. We can put him first in all of our activities. And if we do, verse 3 tells us what the consequences, or I shouldn't say consequences, what the blessings are of the man who does not do these things, the man who does not stand in the path of the sinner or walk in the counsel of the ungodly or sit in the seat of the scornful, the man whose delight is in the Lord, he will be like a tree planted by rivers of water. And I like that phrase right there. When you think of a river of water and a tree, you might think of something like what we see around here all the time. You have the Yamhill River, and you have all these trees that grow along the river, and they're watered, and, you know, it's all kind of a natural thing. But really, if you were to do a word study on this particular verse right here, it talks about irrigation. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about a tree that's been purposely planted in a place where it's going to be constantly watered and irrigated. And this is exactly what God has done in our lives. He purposely called us. He purposely planted us, and he planted us in a place where we will be able to have all of the nourishment that we need. And it tells us that we will bring forth fruit in our season. The word river, planted by the rivers of water, is actually the word channel, like an irrigation channel. That's what it's talking about there. So this isn't like a seed that fell from the tree and hit the ground and sprouted and grew next to a river, which is what we think of a lot of times. But this is something that's been done purposely by God. You are the tree, and you have been planted by an irrigation ditch where you'll never, ever be thirsty. You'll always have what you need, and you will bring forth fruit. And you know what kind of soil God plants us in? The best. The best, the rich soil, right? He's not going to plant us in dead ground. He's going to plant us in a place where we will be able to bring forth fruit in our lives, in our season. And let's face it, we all go through seasons, don't we? Going through one right now that I'm not really crazy about, you know, when the weather changes and the sun goes away and it's definitely a radical change of the season. But it's part of the process to look forward to spring, to look forward to summer when it comes. But the Lord, when he plants you and me like he has, he plants us purposely in the perfect spot, in the perfect uh, environment, so that we might bring forth much fruit in our lives. And if we wanted to, we could go over and look at the fruit of the Spirit and see what he's talking about. What kind of fruit is he talking about? I was out, actually just a couple days ago, I was out walking around on the property and uh, I got this old apple tree out there and it's dropped about 100 apples on the ground. You know, I'm sure a lot of your trees have done the same thing this year. And I thought, what a waste. All that fruit, you know, just laying there on the ground. But then I noticed that the birds were eating it. And they would come down and pecking on these little apples and getting pieces off of it. And the varmints were coming around. And, you know, those apples are not going to go to waste. Those apples are going to feed some creatures when times get tough throughout the winter. And so with that tree bearing fruit, you might think, what a waste, all that fruit on the ground. But you know what? It's going to get used. It's good. I don't remember going out in the spring and seeing any dead apples on the ground out there because they're all gone. They're eaten up, 
whether by animals or birds or whatever it might be. But you and I, again, that's the whole idea behind bearing much fruit so that other people can be blessed by it, so other people can be nourished by our excess fruit that we display on our tree. It brings forth fruit in its season. That's an important thing, too. You don't, you know, you don't start driving a car at five years old, right? You start driving a car in its season, so to speak. When you reach that place in your life where you're capable of doing something like that and doing it responsibly and safely. Well, I've known many, many Christians over the years that get born again and they're real excited about it and they've been walking with the Lord for three weeks and suddenly they're called to the ministry. You know. God's called me to be a prophet or a pastor or a Bible teacher. I just know it. Evangelist. Oh, you know. And you're like, yeah, okay, well, that's good. That's really exciting to know that, you know. And, uh, but, you know, maybe you ought to wait until it's your season, until your fruit is ripe, until you're mature to be able to go out and do that effectively. And too many times I think people jump the gun because of their excitement and things kind of fall apart and they're not really prepared for what they're stepping into. And a lot of times they wind up walking away from it when God really did have a calling on their life. But they were impatient. They didn't allow God's process to work in their life to bring them to that place where they were ready now to be able to deal with all the good, the bad, and the ugly of whatever ministry God's called them into. And, you know, many times we have folks that, you know, oh, I want to help with this, and I want to do that, and I want to do this and that. And then about two or three weeks later, they have this grimace on their face, you know. I don't know why I ever volunteered to do this. These kids are brats. I can't take it, you know, kind of a thing. Well, maybe you weren't ready. Maybe you weren't grown up enough. Maybe you weren't bearing fruit yet. Maybe you're a sapling Maybe you're still needing to be fed and, and, and grow up in the Spirit and in the things of God. And when the time comes, when the season comes, you will bring forth fruit. And I like this right here because we drive around right now during this time of year and we see leaves all over the ground. Can you imagine being a tree who doesn't lose its leaf? Not a one. That's amazing. That's a miracle. That's a God tree. Right? Because all the trees lose their leaves, but this is different. This is, this is a godly tree. This is, this is us. Our leaf will not wither. And I love this last part of this verse 3. It's a promise, and it's a powerful promise. Whatever you do will prosper. Think of that. That's kind of like some of the promises that Jesus made. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. And again, I think that a lot of this has to do with maturity, spiritual maturity. God is not going to bless my request if they're designed to consume upon my own lust or my own pride or my own agenda or whatever it might be. That's what James tells us. We ask in faith, and we say, Lord, if it's your will, I would love to have this happening in my life. I want to be this person. I want to be that person. I want to do this. I want to serve in this way. I want to prosper. But we have to be able to say, but Lord, you're my instructor. You're my tutor. You're my teacher. And Holy Spirit, I'm going to allow you to guide me and direct me and grow me up. And I know that growing up has a lot to do with disappointment, feelings of failure, embarrassment, uh, all sorts of different emotions that come in, but yet still having the desire to get up and keep moving forward in that same area. A person that works at it for a little while and then turns away from it, well, maybe they weren't called to do it in the first place. Maybe they thought they were called but maybe they weren't. Maybe their own 
desire for attention or recognition might have put them in that kind of a mindset. But if God doesn't call us, then our leaf will wither. We will burn out. We will get frustrated. We will walk away from it. And it happens all the time. I think God wants us to bring forth much fruit to glorify Him. And in glorifying Him, in turn, we are blessed by that, and it prospers in our life. Our maturity level grows. Our message becomes more effective uh, as we share with different people to prosper. You know, that's what Spock used to say, right? Live long and prosper. Something like that. How'd you do it? Oh, like that. Okay. Live long and prosper, pointy-eared fellow. Whatever he does will prosper. Now, that's one fellow. Now, the other guy, we're going to get to know him a little bit here in verse 4. He's the ungodly. He's the one that is walking in the council, standing in the path, and sitting in the seat of the scornful. He's the one that's giving the believer a hard time. He's the one who wants to uh, disrespect a person's faith. The ungodly aren't like that. The ungodly are all about self. And when you're all about self, your life becomes very, very shallow. Like chaff. What is chaff? What's he mean when he's talking about chaff? Is that like a shell? Kind of like a shell? So each kernel of wheat has a little husk or a chaff on it. So you go over there today and you see them throwing the wheat up in the air in their little blankets and stuff or whatever they do it with, right? They throw in the air and the wind is blowing away the chaff as it comes off the seed. It'd be kind of like trying to eat a corn on the cob without the corn, right? Just this big old lump of chaff. Not much nourishment there, you know, and I could imagine you would choke on it a few times. It's getting stuck in your throat, all that chaff. The ungodly aren't like those who are planted by the river. They're like the chaff which the wind drives away. That's really a sad commentary. It really is. It's a sad commentary to think that a person could put effort in their whole life to try to accomplish this, accomplish that, to become rich or whatever, but their life is chaff. It's, there's nothing to it. You know, I, I know that there's another thing that I think of a lot is when you hear sometimes these messages that are being put out they're not just chaff. Some of them are even worse. Some of them are like cotton candy. I mean, you want to go buy a cotton candy and it's like huge, right, at the fair? You get this big old giant thing of cotton candy and they put it on a little stick and, and you start eating it. And you know what? It's big and it's fluffy and it's pretty and it's sweet and it's really, really good and it melts in your mouth and it goes down in your tummy and there's absolutely no nourishment to it whatsoever, right? Maybe a sugar rush. Cotton candy and chaff are a lot alike. There's no nourishment to them. Everything that a person does in his life to try to make himself whatever he might want to be outside of the plan of God, then you just become chaff. It becomes unimportant. It becomes useless. Just like Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Your life is chaff apart from from me and the wind is just going to blow it away and you're going to be blown away with it therefore what's that word therefore therefore (laughs) 
Therefore, because of what we have already read, in mind of what has been said, therefore, the ungodly will not stand in the judgment. Now, that's kind of a visual for you. If they're not standing, what are they doing? I kind of envision them in the fetal position, squirming, terrified, naked, busted, exposed. The ungodly cannot stand in the judgment because they're guilty. And there will be no sinners in the congregation of the righteous. We will be there because we're so righteous. We're so perfect. We're so much better than them, right? That's why we're going to be there. Look out for the lightning bolt. It's coming. (laughs) No, not because of that at all. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ, who don't walk after the flesh but after the Spirit, right? That's who we are. There's no condemnation. Yes, there was judgment. Sure. But it was put on my Messiah. It was put on my Savior, that judgment was. And so was the punishment. And sinners will not stand in the congregation of the righteous because the congregation of the righteous are going to be clothed in white. We're going to be clothed in robes of righteousness. And each one of us has a custom-fit robe of righteousness that we're going to be wearing when we get there. It's not one size fits all. He's made a custom one for each one of us. And we will stand. We'll be standing with the Lord, worshiping Him. It's going to be a beautiful thing. Now, I think a lot of times we try to do good and we work hard to do good and we want things to be good. And it just seems like we don't get any credit for it. It's almost like God's not watching. It's like he's not paying attention. And we kind of sometimes feel like our efforts are in vain. Because nothing's changing, nothing's getting better. But you know what? God still sees what we do. He still sees the things that we do to serve him and to help other people. And how we live our lives. He's watching. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows our hearts. So does God hate? It's a good question. The Bible says he loved Jacob and hated Esau. Isn't that what it says? So when we think of hate, I don't think that's exactly what he was trying to get across. Actually, it says, literally, he loved Jacob, he loved Esau less, because he knew his heart already. He already knew his heart. That's why the promise didn't go to him. He was a man that couldn't handle the promise. It went to the next person. And you know what? A lot of times that happens with us, too. God has called people to serve him, to bless them, to serve his Uh, in ministry and loving on people and they walk away from that he says I already knew their hearts before they even came I already knew he already knows my heart he knows my heart a lot better than I do and I'm glad of that because my heart can be deceptive right I have all of the combustible material in me that I need all I need is the spark to get me in trouble, right? And the whole idea is to say, Lord, I'm going to stay away from that. I'm walking with you. I'm not walking in the counsel of the ungodly. I'm not walking in the way of the world. I'm going to walk in the way of righteousness with my life, especially in the days that we're living in right now. I think people are hungry for the real thing. I think people desire the real thing. And frankly, they're tired of being disappointed. They're tired of being lied to as I yawn. (laughs) 
But the Lord knows the way. The Lord knows your heart. The Lord knows the way of the righteous. And when I look over at my neighbor and I think to myself, how does he get away with that? How can he live his life like that? It's just not fair, okay? I know he's a crook. He's got all this money. He's got all the success. He's got all the stuff, and he's a crook. Well, you know what? God knows about that too, doesn't he? He does. He knows about that. It says the way of the ungodly will perish. And, of course, when we read the word perish, we know it doesn't mean cease to exist but they will perish from the presence of the Lord. See, everybody has eternal existence. That's right. We're all going to be existing after we leave these bodies in some form, either in the presence of the Lord or not. I wouldn't call it, for the ungodly, I wouldn't call it life because life has the idea of being one with God being brought together with the Lord and the righteous people in our lives. But the way the ungodly, it says here, will perish. They'll be separated from God forever. And they're going to feel it and they're going to experience it and they're going to have regret for a long, long time, forever. I don't know what that looks like. I really can't imagine what that looks like. I can't even really imagine what eternity looks like, nonetheless being apart from God for all eternity. cannot imagine that. I think that's the day as judgment comes upon people that are ungodly, that's the day that they're going to wish they could try it again. That's the day that they're going to wish that there was reincarnation or something like that. That they might get another chance because now I know, God, that you're real. I know you're serious. And so I promise if you give me another chance, I'll go back and do it right this time. It's not how it happens. Matter of fact, the Bible is very clear that it's, 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 it's determined that man would die one time and then be accountable for that life. So we're all going to be accountable. But the ungodly are going to perish. I'm going to be accountable for the things that I've done in Christ. As a pastor, as a Christian man, as a husband, as a father, I'll be accountable. But I won't be in the congregation of the ungodly. I'll be in the congregation with you, the righteous. Hopefully, prayerfully, as we move forward on the path that we're going to hear the Lord say, that's right, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what I want to hear. It'll all be worth it when we hear that, don't you think? I think so. So this short little six verses right here really has a lot of good knowledge and information in it. It shows us a pattern that we want to stay away from. You know, we don't just wake up one morning with a destroyed life. It takes time to ruin our lives. It's a process. And that process is revealed here in this psalm. But yet on the other hand, On the other side of the same coin, if you will, we have an option. We have a choice that we don't have to go down that path. We can go down the path that God has for us. Because the Lord knows the way of the righteous. So we're in uncertain times. We really don't know what's going to happen in the near future. It's probably a good thing. Uh... But I would say let's continue seeking the Lord, meditating on Him day and night, being obedient. You know, somebody told me a long time ago before I ever got into a ministry that my responsibility of being in the ministry isn't results. My responsibility is faithfulness. 
Leave the results to God. Right? And I think it's that way with all of our walks. We're faithful. We're obedient. God provides the good result in our lives, and we see that. Gosh, sitting back and thinking about how much God has blessed our church and, and our lives since this whole thing started, it's an amazing thing. It's a miracle. It really is. And it's humbling to know that, that we get to be a part of that together. We have ups and downs. Well, you bet we do have ups and downs and difficulties and all of those kinds of things. But, you know, I believe that's just part of growing part of learning, part of maturing. Never quit, never walk away, never give up. Always trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and what will he do? He will make your path straight, that's right. Father, thank you so much for your promises. Lord, we want to be that tree we want to bear fruit for you. Fruit, Lord, that glorifies you, that points to you, not to ourselves. And we are so thankful, Lord, that you've given us your word, whereby we might find that, that map, if you will, to success, to where we need to be with you. Whether it be right now in this moment, or in the coming years, or even in eternity. We have it all here before us. And we might glean from it and learn from it and grow and bear fruit. But Lord, we confess to you, Lord, we do fall short. Father, we pray for forgiveness for those days, those times, those moments of doubt or fear or uncertainty or anger. Lord, fill us up with your love. Holy Spirit, guide us and direct us. Take control of our lives. Change the way we think. Transform us, Lord, into your image as we live in these final days. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, Psalm 1. There you go. Thank you very much. <laughs>